Welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa, where a panel of five discuss five thought-provoking topics. Here, we call a spade a spade, and like we say, no holds barred. I'm talking about the real big brother in Nigeria. Shola points her spotlight on the growing discussions on the issue of value-added tax. Adebola is explaining to us clearly the difference between feminism and misandry. Tolu is asking if we are broke because we are sick or vice versa. And finally, Comfort speaks on the human cycle and need for healthy living. It's an array of topical issues spiced with seriousness and laughter. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this break. The real big brother. Most young people are entwined in the popular show because it's something they actually understand. It's also very quite straightforward. But the real big brother in any country is politics. You don't have to like it, but it will always have you in the diary room engaging you, regardless of what you think of it. Most people blame the below 35s for the reason Nigeria is the way it is and attribute their focus on the reality show to the inaction of politicking. But if they are young, if asked what is politics, some will say someone in Abuja. Others might think someone in Babariga or Agbada. Some, to some's minds, posters will come to it. It's hard for some 18-year-old to relate with the Constitution and how it affects them. I think it's a bit much asking them. After all, when I was 18, all I wanted to do was have the latest 50 cent CDs. Let's be honest. For the older generation that blames them repeatedly, if we did our jobs, they won't be so lost in translation. Dear youth of Nigeria, the real big brother is politics. But what then is the world called politics? Politics is made up of too much to place in a conversation. But its cardinal points are governance, which is how, of course, a, a, an elected government handles its citizens and its policies. Political parties, which are, of course, vehicles to a political office. Influence, which, of course, is what's exerted to cause people to make decisions. Power, which is the use of political will. To solve this problem, the onus is on us ahead to stop the knowledge of everything and our transmission of knowledge being nothing. We must first educate. The level of politicity in Nigeria is poor and we must learn to make political literacy attractive. Next, we must participate to imbibe a culture of practice and teach little log nuggets like, do you know local government elected representatives like your councillors and chairmen don't have immunity. So if they defraud any of you in a contract or with something else, you can sue them and they'll actually go to jail. We also need to stop telling them elections can be won on social media. If we do, we will enable them to be bred just exactly like us. Finally, we must allow them, that is the use of Nigeria, the freedom to choose. While enjoying the reality show, we could maybe teach them that po politics could be as seamless as the show if the foundation laid for it was solid. Lastly, we cannot discuss the future of Nigeria with the Jurassic Park of the country. And of course, the Jurassic Park, you know what I mean. Inclusion is everything. There's an Azikiwe in all of us. Age is a perception of wisdom in Africa, but vision will create the Obama of Nigeria only. Oh. It's clear what were you saying? <laughs> because <laughs> this conversation is what we have been saying all this while, that we have failed, and in failing, we haven't carried the, as you, call, you, know, as you said, the below 35 along with us. And so because of how the Jurassic Park is, 
let's be fair or honest, the youth are lost in escapism. They would rather be in that, um, in that sphere. Does that make it right? Um, no, but I don't also want to say, you know, talk about the helplessness of the situation because even you and I, you know, who, you know, who are, you know, somewhat educated, you know, political wise and all, at least you've thrown your hat in the ring. So, I mean, I'll give you kudos. I haven't bothered to, but I have my um, PVC. So I'm part of the political cast. I'm doing something. But on a serious note, how do we, we have been emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, everything battered in this country. How do we, even we who are supposed to teach them, how do we rise above that? to help the next generation. I honestly, I'm asking a question because it keeps me up at night, really. Because I mean, I have a younger generation I'm bringing up as it is, but I'm helpless. I feel helpless. The truth yeah. is, I think somewhere along the line, we're actually forced by that, those Jurassic Park to think we're helpless. Mm -hmm. And they only thrive because they know they have imbibed that thought, that knowledge and that process that we are helpless into us. Absolutely. If we instinctively stood up, there will be a problem. This if yeah. has been going on for a while. You, you know how they say perception is stronger than reality, yeah. right? I think that's a that's a big that's a big uh, factor in this case, because hey, you can't give what you don't have, right? If you think about the fact that these people already believe, I mean, for instance, something as simple as an election, there's already the belief that, you know, votes don't count. Mm. So because votes don't count, people don't vote. People do not vote, then there's no election. So because that perception is really strong, until someone starts to deliberately change the perception of the younger people, nothing will happen because they don't know. And you can't give what you don't have. So they need that information. They need that reorientation. I, for instance, you know, start talking about voting. I'm one of the corporates because I had the perception, but not but I'm very clear now, having seen things happen around. Sorry, my alarm always goes off at three, even when my phone is off. Sorry. So I just start from, yeah. So I, for instance, I'm a culprit when it comes to elections, right? And because the perception is so strong, but I've now made a deliberate effort to say, you know what? If it's that one vote, let it count. And then if another person joins me, then another person, then before you know it, we're 200, we're 5,000, we're 200,000, they're 1 million, and then we'll start to make a difference. So I think it starts with that education and orientation. Yeah, talking about yes. people joining forces, Remember what happened during the NSAS protest? During the NSAS protest, a lot of people came out to, to speak. People slept outside, made sacrifices. People cooked for each other. Everybody came together. To, but at the end of the day, what did, we, what did we have out of it? Nothing. So I just believe the NSAS protest, I wouldn't call it, um, I wouldn't say it had no impact, but the desires of the youth in that protest wasn't fulfilled. We, we do not, and at the end of the day, there was a lot of um, issues. We had a tri tribunal set up to make uh, inquiries on all that transpired. So how many youths today are willing to come out to, to stand for justice, like to say, we don't want this anymore? A lot of people would rather sit back and watch because they do not want to die for Nigeria. Actually, it's not even worth it to die for this country. So nobody is willing to make that sacrifice. We know countries, even Ghana, Ghana, yeah, had their, their, their period where they had to go through that reform, you know. So how many Nigerians, even young Nigerians, are not even willing to make that sacrifice? Those who have made the efforts in the past, all efforts proved abortive. So that, that's my own opinion. You know, um I had the opportunity during the NSAS time to sit down with, you know, quite some people high up in the legislative system. Mm -hmm. I've never seen them so scared. Mm -hmm. Do you know what was the flaw in NSAS? Mm -hmm. The poor understanding of politics and how it works mm -hmm. by the people. Yes. Yeah. The, because the truth exactly. is, the number of people that were out were mm -hmm. enough to take out the entire Lagos State House of Assembly, right. to recall the entire Lagos State federal representatives. Exactly. But because they were looking at something else, if they did that, exactly. yeah. mm. they would have triggered massive recalls of, of State House of Assemblies across. And once you've recalled, and this is constitutional, mm. 
Mm -hmm. Once you've recalled the House of Assembly, mm -hmm. <laughs> impeaching a governor is zero now. Mm. It's down the road. Mm. And this would have totally changed the whole game. Mm. And we could have, you don't need to wait for an, a whole election to take out such a system. I mean, but they have implanted it in you. Ah, come on, recalls are hard. Don't try it. That's I, what I, 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 I appreciate yeah. the fact that you brought out that point. And this is where then you would also say it's the responsibility of the youth. It's their responsibility to it's get educated. But you see, because as you said, we're in this Jurassic Park and there's a lot going on, we've allowed, they've allowed the externals to distract them. And so escapism is the best thing. This is the best way. You will find them in their droves, but where? In the wrong places. Mm. So what makes, what, what would, how, how would I put this? Why aren't they angry enough? I think that is it for me. Why aren't they angry enough about the leadership? the politics in the country, knowing full well that they are in the majority. I think for me, that is where the, the question should be. Why aren't you angry enough, you know, to use your mask there? I, th I think she could be, she would best. Okay, she should that. tell us, go. Yeah, why aren't you people answer. angry enough? Hmm? I'm still putting my thoughts together. Okay. Okay, so, and then, you know, for me, at this stage, you were talking about even knowing your local government chairman and all that. When we were growing up, yes, it was part of the thing. In fact, part of your exam. You had to know the states of the country, eh? state mm -hmm. and the yes, capital, the capital, and then the governor. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody bothers anymore. Yeah. So that deliberate action, too, mm -hmm. by the government has been taken away because it was part of the curriculum. You had to have it. You had to write the exam on it. Mm -hmm. So it became part of you as you grew up, that you knew about your country, your state, what foods were eaten there, what were the traditional uh, ceremonies and all that. We grew up knowing all those things. The, the, this generation doesn't know anything. You, you, know, uh, you know, in closing, I'd like to say something. I said something one day on media on uh, uh, the, uh, the show, and then I said uh, local governments don't have immunity. And people were shocked, and some lawyers were like, they're going to go and check the constitution. And I was laughing, because they actually don't. And it's something most of us don't know. Anyway, up next is Shola on the issue of taxation. Stay with us. Value-added tax is the world's most common form of consumption tax. It is the difference between the business sales and the purchase of goods and services from other businesses. With more than 160 countries using a value-added taxation system, this system is mostly used in the European Union, which the United States is not one of them. In Nigeria, the Federal Inland Revenue Service had the responsibility of collecting VAT on behalf of the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory. This is shared among the federal, state, and local government as an allocation with the federal government, taking 15%, whilst the states and local government share the remaining 50%. A federal high court in Port Harcourt ruled on the 10th of August 2021, restraining the Federal Inland Revenue Service from demanding taxes from the residents of river states, which impliedly affects other states. He further ruled that states should commence the collection of VAT, which is the value-added tax and personal income tax. Following this groundbreaking ruling, the Lagos State Government has demonstrated its consent to begin collection of value-added tax with a proactive strategy in compliance with the new reform. Lagos has further directed the Federal Inland Revenue Service to stop using demand notices for payment of VAT and further instructed the FIRS to render the accounts within seven days of all the sums collected. By the court order, both Governor Wike of River State and Governor Babajide Sonwolu of Lagos State had signed into law bills authorizing the state government to collect a value added tax, a move being resisted by the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Meanwhile, states like Gombe and a few northern states have appealed to the southern governors to rescind their steps and seek continuation of the process that allows the FIRS to collect VATs. States like Delta, Kaduna, Oyo, Katsina, Kanu may experience a minimal impact, while other 30 states that account for lower revenue generation within their states 
are currently perplexed on what steps to take. Surprisingly, majority of the northern states have opposed the ruling of the court, considering its huge impact on the state revenue, as they have solely relied on the federal government without deliberate strategies for internal revenue generation within their states. This new legal reform will impact positively the financial and social economic sectors of the economy, as the state and local government will no longer rely on the federal government to boost their internally generated revenue. With all states having to take charge of their territories, this will urge states to look inwards and seek ways to diversify their economies. States with dormant revenues will seek to venture into tourism development, production of resources, and massive development of agriculture without total reliance on the oil sector. With about 30 states generating less than 20% of the Nigeria's value added tax, these states will suffer significant revenue decline until they seek meaningful strategies to raise sufficient revenue for state growth and development. Conclusively, it is pertinent for states to look inwardly and develop proactive strategies for internal revenue generation, which would be of immense good to the national and global development of the Nigerian states. Guys, what do you have to say about yeah. the issue when of that? Grand Commander Wiki, <coughs> yes, I, said, I was happy. Good. It's enough. It's enough. Mm. On a serious note, it's mm. enough. Now that um, the, the courts have said people should go and collect their own VAT themselves, yes. we have been shouting about allow the federal government releasing the hold on things like um, what is it mining in the states? Yes, that so that states that have the capacity mm. can do whatever mm. they need to do to mm. generate whatever. So now this will have that rebound effect. If the yes. if the northern states want to be serious, that's where they should get their representatives to work now. Hmm. And say, look, oh, we can't do this thing unless you people sit down and help us remove this chain that is on us so that we'll be able to use, the federal government is not involved, work out a, a formula. Yes. Uh, maybe we'll give them 15% of whatever it is that we generate. Our own. But I think it's enough. We can't have states relying solely on other uh, states for mm. survival. It's not fair. Mm. Uh, um, for example, I think the one that has really come up is the issue of the alcohol. That it mm. is part of VAT. Mm. You take the VAT from um, alcohol, you just, nobody's, no, none of the northern countries, um, states says, oh, no, 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 no. please, remove alcohol. that no, part no, of no, that yes. bad part of the VAT. We don't want it. They collect it. Yet, when people who are supposed to be living in a country that is secular want to sell the alcohol in the state, you seize it and you destroy it. But you collect the money from the federal government. So it's in the, in the double standard. No, I want to mm. bless that judge. You know, yes. so, mm. you, know, you see? I, mm. would, I would okay. never have thought mm. that the political climate of Nigeria, which is usually destructive, will produce something good. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's kind of... But states that are doing well, like Lagos, should also keep one clear thing in thought. If there should be a clear restructuring down like this, Lagos will not be the one with a port alone. And that will cut down more than 70% of Lagos revenue. Lagos should wake up to it. Then, yeah, then no, I'm looking at it. The competition, no, it means yes. that the competition yes. is on. Good. And this is exactly yes. what we want. Yes. Because yes. you cannot have states. For me, if Zamfara cannot function, Sokoto State should buy them. That is, no, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Countries yeah, right now, countries, countries in the world right now operate like businesses. Absolutely. If I'm Sokoto State and Sanfara, okay, you have a problem. Okay, you know what? Become part of us. Yeah. Our governor is your governor. Merge. Merge. Yeah. We'll take it. Do you understand? Write to the federal government. Pass it by the National Assembly. There's nothing wrong in that. I feel we have too many states. Honestly, because yeah, if you thing. look at the generation of uh, VAT, Lagos, Akwaibom, Kaduna, and the rest are funny people. As in they are below par. You, and, no, you, 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 know, you kept saying northern states. Funny, there are a lot of southern states spending this. Well. Abia, for, Abia is totally doing nothing. Mm. They are being spoon mm. fed by the, by the federal government. government. Yeah. There are a lot of southern gov uh, states in this. So, Honestly, I, I feel very strongly that every state in Nigeria has a potential. Yes. It's yeah. just a question of thinking, of actually doing the hard work and the diligence of thinking. I don't think there's any state that by itself is useless. However, if you have done this thinking for four or five or ten years and you find that you are not useful, by all means, merge with another state. Why do you have 36 states and only six to ten states are actually generating income? Then why do you have the remaining states? Is it just for the, I mean, for the purpose, for the vanity 
purpose of saying, oh, we have 36 states. If no. we need 10 states in Nigeria, so be it. Let's have 10 states. We and need let's, a, they need a government. They, yeah. they need a government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> this is so, I mean, I feel like every state has potential. It mm -hmm. just takes, I mean, give me any state in Nigeria and put a think tank in that state. They will mm -hmm. tell you exactly what you can do with that state no, to generate income. the federal government. Right? Um, hold on the resources of the state. Of the state. That's it. So that's why I'm saying but, that the, but, the state too need to wake up and make their own no, representatives. Do you yeah. know why the federal government can put that handcuff? States too, uh, they have refused to let go of the feeding bottle of Central. Mm -hmm. exactly. they, they want to, like in this situation with VAT, you will notice that they want to collect the VAT. Yeah. They still want to collect federal allocation, allocation. from allocation. How now? You, yes. It doesn't work yes. that way. <laughs> you, 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 you take money, one. Right? You they will take start one. thinking and saying, oh, we have tourism. Yeah. Oh, we have this resource. So that's what happens. Like like once you cut off that supply, then people start I was to in Yobe State. Mm. Then, when I got to Yobe State, the first thing I thought of was a desert rally. It's that beautiful. Yeah, you have small oasis. Imagine. Imagine. It's that been, and that desert has been the, Dubai has been a desert it's, for how many years? Look at what they've yes. done with it. So be, we have those deserts. It's finer than uh, Dubai because it has those small, small the oasis which sand. are more. And oh, then you right, know, right. those palms, you know, they are, in, they are in shorter distance. They are not like the yes. Sahara desert that before you see what I trek. See <laughs> you how we killed Tinapa. Yeah? Yes. Tinapa was killed. Think about that. I think what even hurts me the most is why we don't have a five star hotel with a golf course at the confluence. How many confluences are in exactly. the world? There are just about three. Kogi yes. is sleeping. Kogi and the yeah. United States, I you know? To, I want to believe that if we can have more people, more indigenous of all these states that are not as developed as that of Lagos and Abuja, if we can have a lot of them come out to want to privatize some of these businesses, mm -hmm. I think that what they can do will be more than what the government can do because then it's something that they are spending their own money on and they want to develop their states yes. and give them more global recognition. Fantastic. But the government yeah. is not ready to let go no, of that. It's not even the government. Yeah. What scares the people is the fact that once the governor changes, the money you've invested, yeah. you've yeah. Shot, yeah. that's where the problem is. But you see, policy. this bad thing is a good thing. No, it's a good thing. Yeah, I couldn't believe right it. Absolutely. Yes. yes. We know that it's not yes. from a heart of they want to do. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. we are happy to hear this enough. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So we'll keep this conversation going. The issue of VAT cannot be overemphasized. Adebola is next after this break. Stay with us. Feminism versus misandry. A lot of people are getting it all wrong. The fact that we get a lot of people complain about these people that call themselves feminists is a good thing. I'll tell you why. We've gotten noticed and have built a presence. A presence that is going to last a long, long time. Feminism, true feminism, is the belief in and advocacy of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes expressed, especially through organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary. This means that a feminist is someone who believes that women and girls have every right to hold political, economic, and high social positions without any oppression from the opposite sex. Lately, it seems to me that we have misandrists hiding under the feminist banner. They are normal people like you and me and are everywhere. Misandrists hate men and boys in general. Misandry could be belittling, being violent, and completely excluding yourself from any activity involving men. Here in Nigeria, we may not have come across such offensive comments, but we see it in their actions. The thing is that a lot of people are misandrists without even knowing it. Some just don't want to believe or even admit it. Think about the times you were in school as a little girl and objected from participating in extracurricular activities with boys. Or worse, holding hands. That's how long misandry has been living amongst us. Feminism is all about empowering, about women supporting women and girls supporting girls to a just cause, building one another up for the seeable future. Why have I brought this up? It's about time that we lay it down on the table. We've got quite a number of them that look at us feminists as misandrists. 
They take a part of the blame for being ignorant and not sourcing for knowledge. Regardless of the sex, if you believe that women and girls have every right to hold exclusive positions as men in all fields, you are a feminist. Yes, you are a feminist. Are you a feminist? You wouldn't as a man deny your wife, sister, mother or friend a position that you are entitled to. Would you? So are we all feminists? No, I'm not. I'm a human being. I think for me, that had been, has always been my issue with the tagging. You know, there's always, when it comes to women issues, we tend to, you know, want to label things. When we're, we're, we're human beings, I think we should look more at these issues from the lens of, you know, human beings. If a man is a human being, a woman is a human being. So if a human is entitled to go and work and earn 5,000 naira, then you don't, it has nothing to do with the sex. If it's a human being, you are entitled to work. Number two, um, feminism got a bad name from the people practicing it because well, I, today is the first time I'm hearing of Minini, Miss Misanji. Uh -huh. It's today I'm hearing it because feminism had carried all of it because of the people who were behind it. It's now that feminism is better defined because they needed to step out and make it clear. We don't hate men, no. It's just the way we have been shouting and doing it. It's, it's not we have been very aggressive. Okay, so we'll be ladylike about it, but now presenting you know, the, um, the issues going forward. Um, number three, the one about holding hands, it's not because we were Miss An Andreas, what's the... Miss uh -huh. We were practicing it. We were young. They said we should, if we touch boys, we'll get pregnant. It had nothing to do with it. We didn't know what it was. We were, we were supposed to be till we got to a certain stage and all. So what I'm just saying is that I, I think going forward now that, you know, thankfully, you know, feminism is beginning to bring itself out as, look, it's economic, social, you know, the general well-being of women in relation to, you know, all these factors. It's clear. It's not that we hate men or we're aggressive or we don't want them or whatever, but we want to make sure that we're heard. I think there should be the emphasis also on the fact that we're human first. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, That's human right. first. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, yes, in an ideal world, in a utopia, Yes, we're humans, but the reality today is no, we're not, mm. right? So the women don't have the rights that they should have. Yeah. So you'd expect that somebody was, is thinking extra and saying how, I mean, I have two daughters, I have a wife, I'm already outnumbered, <laughs> right? So um, <laughs> I'm, whether I like it or not, I'm a feminist. But beyond that, beyond the labeling, like, yeah, like Comfort labeling. said, is what is the spirit behind it, yeah. right? What is the objective? What are we trying to achieve with the whole idea of feminism is equality. Right, is saying if a man deserves 200 naira, then a woman deserves just as much. Right, a woman doesn't deserve 199. Once it's one naira short, someone needs to say, What's going on here? Yeah, that's basically the spirit behind it. Yeah, and once it crosses that and becomes another thing, then it becomes abuse. Yeah, right, so it's just achieving the critical balance between understanding the objective and the outcome you want to, you know, uh, you want to get versus when you now cross the line and then it becomes you know, something else, and it's easy to now label you and say, oh, then throw away the baby with the bathwater. I, so. I think what has caused the reason for the clear distinction mm -hmm. is that they found out, or feminists found out, that mm -hmm. they had become the same thing they were fighting. Mm -hmm. And that okay. has shown clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, you know, in, this, and in that kind of world, Man was had already started becoming an indigenous species <laughs> because <laughs> they seem to take it to a wounded line or takes things more personal. So they seem to take it to another level. But like Comfort said also, I have always called myself a humanist. I, I believe everybody deserves the best of opportunities they get, regardless of gender, tribe, religion. I even always say governance is not based on gender, tribe, or religion. So I, I don't look at it anyway. A lot of people have grown to see things differently. When mm. yeah, so there's people that once they just read a story, and I've seen this occur on social media, once they read a story, they don't even want to know the other side of the story. If it's a woman, they are behind the woman. Mm. If it's a man, they are behind the man. Mm. They don't want to know how else it occurred. And you know, this is creating more of a fracas. And we are becoming a more unintent. You know, a lot of people think we are more intelligent now as a generation. Trust me, mm -hmm. we are far becoming more unintelligent mm -hmm. than the generations, the 14th and 15th century people. Because we have so much information, mm -hmm. but have value for nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm. For me, for me, I think the issue of feminism has been that. misinterpreted. Yes. You know, the initial ideology behind feminism was equality, inclusion for women. Women should be involved in every other thing that the men do. But I think there's been, um, I think the way the message is being passed, is being passed wrongly yes. on certain um, issues. Like for instance, uh, when there was a story on Twitter about a lady who said um, she, she bought a house for her husband or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, so there are a lot of comments like, why would you, you know, buy a, a house for your man? And before we could say anything, mm -hmm. everything just went di in different ways. <laughs> okay. And yeah. all the ladies came out to mm -hmm. say, why would she? Mm -hmm. Like, why would I'll you? you. <laughs> why? <want> you. <laughs> why? Why would you do such a thing? Mm -hmm. Like, what if he cheats? What if mm -hmm. he leaves you? Why would you buy? So, you know, there's this um, women supporting women has also mm. been misinterpreted. Yes. yes, because a lot of women would also, um, if a woman does something wrong, a lot mm. of people say, okay, because she's a woman yeah. and I need to support my fellow woman, I wouldn't scold her. Mm. So I think the issue has been, but it's a very good ideology, especially if we're looking at it in terms of the workplace where you see some organizations, I think things are changing now due to the issue of the feminism ideology. Mm. Things are changing now. A lot of companies would rather employ a man than a woman, but things are much different now. I see a lot of women also taking up very you know, good roles in companies, becoming yeah. like now virtually all the banks have female CEOs. Yeah. Yes, yes. virtually all the banks. I, I'm not sure. I think the education is important as well. Yes. I, why. Yes. I mean, I've conducted a lot of interviews. I find mm. when I ask the men, oh, what do you want to earn? They just go straight on, I want to earn this. But the women will say, oh, you know, a lot of times. You know, they're less. And I say, what, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I do the education right there and then. Yeah. Tell me exactly what you want to earn. I just tell you a guy that's, you know, then you come out tomorrow and say, if I'm, but you, you're here <laughs> shrinking yeah, when it comes yeah. to your value and your worth yeah. as far as money is concerned. Obviously not, you know. So you have to also do that education every now and then and mm -hmm. having to tell people, this is not the time to shrink. You have the opportunity. Okay, you, you have the spotlight. Go ahead. The you know, truth about it. Out in, in okay. point here. Yes. I have never believed that between the sexes there could be equality. I was just I've only okay. believed there could be equity. Very now good. I'll define. I was just about equality, to say equality. I don't. If you give a fifty kg bag of rice to a man and a woman, the man will carry it better. Exactly. You can't expect the woman exactly. to carry it the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. But what you must do is ensure that while she's carrying a fifty kg bag of rice, there's someone to help her because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. There should be a balance. And there are times women are stronger in managerial yes. positions, yes. actually making decisions. They are more emotional and caring about things. Yeah. A man just That's takes obvious. the obvious logical decision, which mm -hmm. might be destructive without thought process. So they both have their advantages. We should learn to play the line according to those advantages. Fantastic. And no more, they just, we just give them equal. It's not possible. That's exactly what I wanted to bring out. That even with the feminism, we have to be realistic and practical with what is on ground. You can't call equality. They say, come on, as you rightly said, log cement. Now you can't do it. But it's the equity that if, a, if there's a job, the number of men that apply should equal the number of women that apply. If he's going to earn this, you should earn that. But there must be a balance struck. Because whether we like it or not, there is a home that needs to be built. We, we can begin to argue it in all shades and groups. But what it is, what is on the ground, is what is on the ground. Yeah. So, yes. so it seems that we have so many misconceptions about feminism. But we have to put this discussion on hold as Tolu is next. Stay tuned. Are we broke because we're sick, or are we sick because we're broke? Ralph Waldo Emerson, an American essayist and philosopher who lived in the 19th century, he used the phrase first. He said, health is wealth. In the context of American people, stating that health is of utmost importance than wealth, and, its true sense, and in its true sense, health is only the real wealth of a person. So a cursory look at the Nigerian health sector really gets us thinking. If indeed health is wealth, how rich would you say we are in Nigeria? Also, if indeed health is wealth, it is rather apparent that only the rich in Nigeria are rich, right? Play on words. Unfortunately, our country is one where human life is not taken as seriously as you would expect. Perhaps we've not been deliberate enough to see how health contributes to wealth. Some statistics might help. You know, looking at some of the best medical sectors in the world, incidentally happen to belong to the top 21 countries with the highest GDPs. 
and then have also the lowest debt profiles. So let's start with Sweden. GDP, $530 billion. The health system, you know, they have a decentralized universal healthcare system for everyone. Sweden's life expectancy is 82.4 years old. This surpasses the life expectancies in Germany, the UK, and the United States. Sweden also has one of the lowest maternal and child mortality rates in the world. There are 5.4 physicians per 1,000 people, which is twice as great as in the US, the UK, and 100%, let that sink in, 100% of births in Sweden are assisted by medical personnel. Let's talk about Germany. GDP, $3.9 trillion. The German healthcare system is a dual public-private system that dates back to the 1880s, making it the oldest in Europe. Healthcare in Germany is funded by statutory contributions, ensuring free healthcare for all. Again, let that sink in, free healthcare for all. Germany is one of the biggest spenders on healthcare in Europe. It spends 11.1 of its annual GDP on healthcare expenditure. Only Switzerland and France spend more in terms of GDP percentage. German healthcare spending works out at just over 4,000 pounds, 4,000 euros per inhabitant every year. Final example, Denmark. $350 billion in dollars in GDP. The healthcare in Denmark is largely provided by the local governments of the five regions with coordination and regulation by the central government. The central government plays a relatively limited role in healthcare in Denmark. Its main functions are to regulate, coordinate, and provide advice. Life expectancy in Denmark has increased from 7.9 7 years in 2005 to 80.6 years, almost 81 years, in 2015. Danish women have a higher life expectancy, it's 2.5 percent, it's 2.5 years in 2015 than Danish men, 78.6 in 2015. In Nigeria, currently, Nigeria's healthcare system ranks among the lowest in the world. A study from 2018 in the Lancet of Global Healthcare Access and Quality looked at 195 countries around the world, and Nigeria scored 142nd. Nigerians usually have to pay for medicine out of their own pocket. Often the medicine is expensive and difficult to afford. In 2019, on average, healthcare made up 6% of Nigerian household spending, with higher figures in the rural areas than in urban areas, for obvious reasons. Resident doctors in Nigeria have been on strike for about six to eight weeks. Technically, there's an MOU in place now waiting to be signed. After several lives have been lost, and another proposal to borrow money added to the already sinking debt profile. So again, I ask, are we broke because we're sick? Or are we sick because we're broke? Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I want to also add to this conversation that you did it out. You missed out the fact that Denmark is just about the size of Cardinal State. Mm. Germany is about, it's less than quarter the size of Northern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. These three states put together, we can either dump them yes. in North or Southern Nigeria, Nigeria. and mm -hmm. there will still be space. Mm -hmm. So, please tell me, and the Danish, I think they are just, they are known for milk. Yeah. Their so cows don't walk around now. They you know? Please. <laughs> oh, what is happening in Nigeria? <laughs> you know, I was really happy during COVID. I was really happy during COVID because we're all trapped here, mm -hmm. rich or poor. Mm -hmm. If you notice, we had some high profile deaths. I didn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's almost as if you knew what I had written about. Anyway, we'll get to the way that Nigerians can survive. Right. But very nice article. I wish you had given us our GDP, mm. uh, you know, also, you know, yeah. and our own life expectancy, just so that we could see the stark reality yes. of what we're living with. And uh, following up on what Kunle said about, you know, the sizes of these countries and all, well, you see, this is what happens when a government is deliberate. If we were as deliberate, I mean, America is a whole continent. Absolutely. Are they not living well, too? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I mean, by, mm -hmm. by many standards, they're living much better than we are. So it's, it still goes back to the issue of leadership, what we care about, who is pushing what, and where, and for what interests. We, the interests in this country are largely driven by, not by, you know, justice or fairness. I... I mean, with all due respect, I understand that the doctors are not happy. How many times are we going to go through this in, in every other year? At what point will you sit down, you know, and think and say, you know what, we, we need to 
get what we need to get without because this is what I swore to. I remember so, I remember the first time I heard of Dr. Strike. Then Professor, he was doctor then, Dr. Olukoe Ransom Kuti was Minister of Health. Mm. I was in primary school. It has continued. He has died. Yes. Mm. Governments have changed. Over 12, 13 governments have That's changed. Cool. Yeah. We are Nothing still in the, I've gone from primary school to university to having a son that is now at that level. And I'm still going through the exact same, same thing. thing yeah. And it's not only that we are not deliberate. Look at how much people spend on health. Yeah. To top it, Nigeria has a, our uh, health, health uh, pension scheme. And it, mm. is that not where they found six billion inside somebody's roof? Mm. How can we continue like this? If you go back to that, COVID. You know, I'm very upset with the amount no. of money that was given to Nigeria for COVID. Yes. And I wondered, you mean there wasn't somebody in that circle, on that panel, that uh, committee, that group, whatever they call themselves, that would have said, you know what, now that we have this thing, right? And we how can't do, escape. How Let's do... build the hospital. Okay. This is so hard. I mean, we are all going to die here. Yeah. <laughs> I think it comes down again to value for human life. Mm -hmm. I think it's really as simple as that. No, I don't, I don't think, think that will value human life. I don't think it's value for human we life. Have because people are dying. Do you know why yes. I know do you know why I know it's not value for human life? So I have this friend, he's within the governance system in an eastern state. Yeah. And then people that come from that eastern state, old old doctors that were retired, spoke to their friends abroad that there was no primary health care center. They were going to stock up a hospital A one. Hmm. Guess what? They the state health mm -hmm. uh, commissioner of health in that state refused to agree. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they are building the hospital for free, but they say no, they want dollars. How many dollars are they giving them? Mm -hmm. You turn down the hospital when you don't have one to ask for dollars. And that's what goes on. Mm. It's just very painful. Like anything else is supposed to be number one. To, will be number one. Like anything else. Because how long do we are we going to keep traveling mm. to treat malaria? A lot of our politicians travel. They tra during COVID, COVID was very beautiful because nobody had to, nobody could leave Nigeria. But how long do we keep traveling to, to, to treat malaria, to treat uh, typhoid, and get health care? You want to say one sentence? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want to say something? Yes, but I was going to say that if they really value human life, I don't see how you are a leader and the well-being of your citizens is not number one in your mind and you're able to sleep mm -hmm. with your eyes closed. You should have a conscience. I mean, health is wealth, like you said. Where, oh my God. Where are we going to... How do I put this? Uh, Draw the line? No, like... How can we move forward when you know that because majority of people who don't have access to quality health care are the poor. And the percentage of the poor people here in the country is way more than the rich mm. who can easily take care of themselves in private hospitals. Yeah. So we just need to... It's not even that easy it's because good. even me now, when my mom tells me she's going to the doctor, my heart is beating. Because by the time she goes and comes back, 100K has died easily. Yeah. That's also every month I'm praying, God, please have mercy. Let her not fall sick. Please have. So, and as it is, as a Nigerian, even with me in this class, it's with prayers, everybody, my dear. Yeah, everybody, everybody is touched by it. I understand stuff. that the yes. doctors yes. need money. They can't prescribe drugs or perform some certain operations or diagnosis without some certain um, equipment. Yes. But yes. still, I mean, I can't remember what that doctor's vow is, but. The health of your patient should be number one. I understand that you can't just leave them to be because you're not being paid. It could have been that they may have not have done their best and they've decided to go on their strike. <laughs> yeah. You know so, guys, okay, so I mean, we can go. This is a whole, mm. you know, one hour mm. topic if we wanted to get on it. We've not even sort of scratched the surface, mm. but I think we've thrown out a few important points. So, um, comfort rounds of the show after this break. Don't go away. Who wants to live forever anyway? The human life circle has six main stages fetus, baby, child, adolescent, adult, and elderly, which we refer to as old. <laughs> the first five we tend to embrace and take care of, but the last stage we either attempt to wish away, ignore, disdain, or mask. With a growing aging population, untimely deaths, and impaired living, 
Conversations on growing a positive attitude to the inevitable dusk years is paramount. While we are somewhat relaxed while going through the other stages of life, we do not focus on investing in practices that will help tide us over an old age. It is when we have a health incident that we scramble to start living better to bribe old age. Just as inevitable as death is, so is old age. And while we cannot run from it, if we embrace it and work with it, it will be kinder to us. It is never too late to make positive changes, however. We must acknowledge the limitations if we start later rather than earlier to work towards an enhanced old age. Recently, plastic surgery has become the bane of aging. From one facelift to the next liposuction to the lifting of sagging bits, we have geriatrics looking odd with sculpted bodies and faces and doing nothing for enhancing the quality of life. The goal is to use our productive years to prepare for age that will lead to a decrease of everything that we once took for granted. While it is taken for granted on this side of the Atlantic that our children will look after us, it is gradually becoming irresponsible to leave the comfort of your old age to your children. There's a place for that, but reality must be faced. Work, train your kids, make investments, save for your latter years. If the kids turn out right and support you, well, great. If they don't, well, great too. You've provided for yourself. There's a thing called healthy aging, which refers to a reduction in the undesired effects of aging. The goals are maintaining physical and mental health, avoiding disorders, and remaining active and independent. Very important. For most people, maintaining general good health requires more effort as they age. Developing certain healthy habits can help such as following a nutritious diet, exercising regularly, and staying mentally active. In this way, people can have some control over what happens to them as they age. Also, several factors influence life expectancy, and gaining knowledge is an added advantage. For example, you know, hereditary. What are those hereditary things? It influences whether a person will develop a disorder, know the family history, lifestyle. Avoiding smoking, not abusing drugs and alcohol, maintaining a healthy weight and diet and exercising help people function well and avoid disorders. Exposure to toxins in the environment, well, it's a bit of a challenge, but it can shorten life expectancy even among people with the best genetic makeup. Healthcare, regular checkups can prevent disorders or treating disorders after they are contracted helps increase life expectancy. Old age may have its limitations and challenges. But despite them, our latter years can be some of the most rewarding and fulfilling of our lives. Time to start being deliberate about taking care of you for you for the dusk of life. Fantastic, fantastic comfort. So, let's you go. Know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I really love that talk. I'll tell you why. My wife always makes sure something that I make, you know, friends with senior citizens. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of old friends, you know, 65, 70, 75 year old friends. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, older friends. And one of the things I've learned about them is in their earlier years, the ones, I mean, and I have all kinds, I have the billionaires, I have the rich ones, I have the ones that are struggling a bit. I realized that most of them, the ones that are doing very well, they made decisions earlier in life. In their 30s, in their 40s, they thought about their 70s and 80s and said, you know what, I have to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And they made those preparations and it's paying off for them now. Mm -hmm. The ones that are not doing too well, well, a few of them, you know, life happened, but they didn't plan well enough. So it's very important to put that plan in, especially in your 30s and 40s, very important to start putting those things in your mind because, like you said, it's like death. Yeah. It's going to come. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's like people say, I mean, I personally, for instance, people say, oh, they have a child, they're looking for money. To, like, but you've had, you've been pregnant for nine months, mm. right? You know you're going to have a child in nine months. Mm. It's similar. Mm. You know you're going to be old. So you must prepare and start making plans to make your, you know, your old age more... You know, you, know. You, know, you know, I work within the private sector. I've always done, I've never worked within the public sector. So when I turned 40, my best friend called me. He works in the UK and he said, Kunde, we both turned 40 this year. He turned in October, I turned in December. So he said, you know what? We're going to start investing in stock and we're going to do this and it's money we're not touching. And I said, why? Bro, mm -hmm. who even told you I have money? I said, I'm, I kept part of some money for you and you add what you have. I'm going to invest in stocks and... <laughs> And it's going to be for our pension. Wow. And I was like, ah, bros, I'm not dying. We're just 40. He said, mm. Mm -mm. 
You say, do you see how zero to forty happened? Yeah. I say, yeah, it was kind of fast. Secondly, exactly we'll be friends. We'll be friends since we're in crash. Yeah. So it was like, did you see how fast that happened? The next forty is that fast. Yeah. <laughs> so even so faster. It's, it's even faster. So it was like, come on, we have to start preparing for it. Yeah. He reminds me of every month, guy, okay, what are you bringing? Bring his own. I'll bring my own. Put. And we started preparing. And I think you need to really be deliberate about it. Yeah. I can say yes, we make a lot of careless decisions. I can say we eat worse than any other generation before us. Absolutely. It's less healthy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of bio-generated rubbish, and which is generally not good for our bodies, which means we probably will tire faster than others. But if you look at the bright side, we have enough intelligence to prepare for ahead. Yeah, yeah, when I hit 35, <coughs> I decided that, you know, number one, I was mm-hmm. going to do a certain thing at 40. I hit that milestone. And then I was lucky enough to read somewhere where it said, by the time, as if there's one demon hovering somewhere, you, the day you hit 40, yeah. something breaks. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it happened to me. The day I hit 40, I think it was my back. Mm-hmm pain. I said, hey, it has happened. So immediately, immediately I started regular checkups, changed my diet, water, it, just those small things, walking 30 minutes every day, just yeah. those things that we weren't doing. Like, can you imagine if I'd started that even 10 years earlier, how I'd look. And I saw the payoff. I honestly saw the payoff. I don't go to the hospital. I really don't. Mostly I don't. I mean, you have the one, two um, things here and there because your body has to whatever. But That's the point really here is, is that I don't go, I need to go to the hospital because I make sure I take my ginger, my lemon. When it's cold, I wear my sweater. You know, being m- more Deliberate. deliberate, yeah. doing mental exercises and all that. And I wish people would just embrace it. If you embrace it, it actually becomes a good thing because now you're not fighting it. So what is it really coming to fight you for? You're not fighting it. I've accepted. I'm old. I'm aging. It will come. My, I'm not as strong. My knees are paining me. My back is paining me. Sleeping <laughs> in the middle of the day. I'm not we're fighting not it. I'm not dragging. <laughs> Besides, we're not even playing football. So no need for football. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Like, it's even like yes. now, it's while I'm still young that mm-hmm. I have all the time to do all the running around, mm-hmm. exactly. all the vigorous exercises, all the um, intensive jobs, eating mm-hmm. healthy, mm-hmm. it will pay off later. Mm-hmm. And all that, live your life to the fullest, enjoy yourself, mm-hmm. and you go about mm-hmm. taking alcohol, smoking, and drinking, and not thinking about tomorrow. Everybody is just worried about today. Mm-hmm. I think that's what my generation, my generation yeah. are really yellow, involved. The yellow generation. All yeah. they are looking forward to is enjoyment, they're not thinking about tomorrow because everything they're chasing is money. And you know, once you have money, mm. you're spending mm. on this, you're spending on that. And that's not the healthy way to live. Shall I say a little yes. bit about the issue of, you know, our <laughs> African parents waiting for us to a grow? To give them yes, money. yes, 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 yes. Because talking about planning, it's very important that when you're in your 30s, 40s, and you have enough time to plan, you begin to plan for your future so that you don't begin to, you won't have to rely on your children. If they give you money, fine. But there is this um, entitlement mentality, not just with parents now, but with everybody. Like mm. some people just, oh, even now down. parents so feel, I, spe- I sent you to school, mm. I gave you everything, so it's time for you to give me back. But and, and fantastic it's topic, no, and know. at this you know, rate, I'm glad that all of us are within the age bracket, you mm-hmm. know, to actually the consciously day. make changes. So, I mean, ho- hopefully we'll spread the uh, message. And that's the size of the show today. Join us again next week on another edition of The Advocate. Please don't just listen. Share The Advocate with family and friends. The more diverse thoughts we share, the richer the solutions they inspire. The advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate NG. And Instagram, at Plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate ng don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel plus tv africa bye for now okay. bye.